I'm John Henry, chairman of the Committee for the Public. When I was uh, elected chairman of the committee uh, two years ago, following uh, Chad Friedman's retirement, first thing I did, first decision I made was to nominate Bruce Fine uh, to be my vice chairman. The reason is simple. No one knows more about separation of powers than Bruce. I hope you've had the opportunity to see Bruce, some of you I know at least have, uh, uh, play James Madison in some of my uh, citizen theater plans at uh, Stone Hill. The committee's mission is to restore the war power, or um, power that the Constitution, you know, our legislature very unique in terms of giving the war power to, to the legislature. Never been done in history before. And that's our focus. Uh, uh, we've uh, extended uh, invitations to uh, congressmen who are here tonight to join us in this discussion. Uh, the Capitol Hill Club couldn't be more convenient uh, for members to attend. And we will have a as our practices have a question and answer period afterwards, which will follow Bruce's remarks. I get into this slide. Well, it's such an August audience. I'm always reminded of President John F. Kennedy's observation when he invited all collection of Nobel Prize winners to dine in the White House. He said, never had so much genius been gathered under a single roof since Thomas Jefferson dying alone. <laughs> <laughs> so with that introduction, thanks for coming. I know the topic is not uh, quite as sexy as oftentimes is uh, Okran in Washington, D.C., but I titled my, my address as Counter-Revolution Against the Constitution. Uh, we've had basically an 18th of Brumaire, if we compare the French Revolution, but it's extended over a long period of time, and it's been executed more by the dereliction of duty of Congress than through military force as Napoleon exercised to become emperor. But the results have been equally devastating. But I want to begin by at least understanding and getting uh, the ground rules about the Constitution of the United States. Uh, it's oftentimes said, well, we need an organic Constitution, times change, we can't live with what people thought about 230 years ago. Well, the framers were, but they understood why they created an amendment process called Article 5. You can amend the Constitution, they've done 27 times. Indeed, what? Our Bill of Rights is an amendment. Uh, we, event, we abolished slavery with an amendment. Someone didn't stand up after the Civil War and said, oh, you know what? Um, Ulysses Grant defeated Lee, so let's have a vote now to see whether we abolish slavery. Actually, I had to go through a process. Process of passing two-thirds of the houses and go to the legislatures for ratification. Now, why is that important? It may seem trite. Process is the difference between civilization and barbarism. Process is everything. You have rules of the game that you must comply with. Otherwise, hey, pick up AK-47s. Why do we have rule of law? Doesn't matter anymore. These things are fundamental to who we are as a country. Very, very fundamental. And also, it's been lost. There is only one oath that members of Congress and the president take under the Constitution to support and defend the Constitution. It doesn't say anything about defending a political party or trying to stay in power or doing anything else other than defending the process of the Constitution. It's a beginning and end. That's what I thought about when I served in the government for many years. We don't have any emergency clause in the Constitution. The president can't suspend the Constitution for emergencies. We don't have any clause that says, oh, the president was elected to make us safe. No, despite President Obama making that one of his code words, his, his soundtrack in his memoir, and he sent it Harvard like I did. No. Don't, you will not find anywhere in the United States Constitution any entrustment of the president with the responsibility to make us safe. Indeed, when the Constitution speaks of suspending the writ of habeas corpus, only Congress can suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Only Congress can. Now, I underscore these things. People say, well, you know, this is technical things. Well, you know, you can kind of take uh, shortcuts through the Constitution. But if you can take a shortcut on one issue, like the war power, where do you stop? Nothing says, well, you can flout the work power, but then you can't flout due process or freedom of religion or freedom of speech or freedom of press. Why can't you say why? You can choose which ones 
You want to flout? I can choose the ones I want to flout. Second Amendment or anything else. That is, it sets a principle that lies around like a loaded weapon, ready to be destroyed. Every principle of the Constitution with any demagogue would be dictator, and there are plenty of candidates for that ignominious role. We're never going to be uh, a short supply of those people who crave limits power. Never. And the Frabers understood that. When they thought about the executive branch, James Madison wrote, George Washington was a prodigy. He wouldn't occur in another thousand years. You know, he could have been king. He said, I don't want it. I fought the war. We need a republic. They had to drag him out of Mount Vernon to be president the first time. The second time, they had to drag him out, and he left. Wrote his farewell address, and he said, yeah, we got to stick with the Constitution. If there are changes that are needed to be made, we need to amend it. We don't jump to lawlessness. Well, with that background, let's see where we are today in the Declare War Clause, where uh, we have not had Congress declare war since Pearl Harbor, although we've been in countless wars. I call them presidential wars. And even in Pearl Harbor, uh, Congress recognized that we were already a state of war. Uh, Pearl Harbor broke the peace. And it's true that if we have already been attacked, the framers, when they discussed the war power of the Constitution Convention, said, of course, the president can respond to sudden attacks that have already broken the peace. He's not begun war. We have been attacked and we can't wait. But that's the last time. Korea, remember, Korea involved 3 million Chinese soldiers, the risk of nuclear war, tens of thousands of casualties. Douglas MacArthur wanted to turn you know, Korea into radioactive wasteland. No declaration of war, nothing. Silence. Did Congress do anything? No. Nope. Said, okay. As long as Harry Truman called it a police action, it's a police action. There may be millions of people dying, but you know, we can play in fantasy land because we don't want to vote on this. I mean, it's it's not an accident, in my judgment, that contemporaneous with the Korean War it was the ratification of the NATO Treaty. Probably all heard about famous or infamous Article 5. Another example of a document being totally warped by this empire mentality. Now, Article 5 states that an attack by one member will be treated as an attack by all. Uh, but Article 11, if you read past Article 5, says implementing the responses to any of the obligations under the treaty shall be in accord with the constitutional processes of the respective parties. When Dean Acheson, then Secretary of State, he's the one that urged Truman to fight the war in Korea without congressional involvement. When he testified about the meaning of Article 5 before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he said, Article 5 does not mean we are at war if a member is attacked. Only Congress can declare war and we have to comply with the constitutional obligations of the war power. And when you look at the committee reports, no, we're not at war under Article 5 if a member is attacked. Look, think of today. Joe Biden repeats, and he's not the only one. The, the conventional media. I've written 15 letters to media saying, you know, you don't really understand Article 5. It doesn't put us to war automatically. Joe Biden says, if there's one inch of a NATO member's attack, we're going to war. He has no authority to say that whatsoever. The whole, art, the whole treaty has been transformed by the empire bias and mentality. No process, no treaty amendment. We have amended the treaty to bring in such wonderful partners as North Macedonia and Montenegro, most recently Finland and Sweden. You do have to amend the treaty. Senate ratified that. But with regard to the interpretation of, of uh, Article 5, Senate, Congress has done nothing and yet permitted it to be turned into a permanent authorization for war of the president. Now, at the Constitutional Convention, there was universal agreement. Only Congress could take us from a state of peace to war. No dissent. They had dissent over a lot of other articles, but that was universal. Same with regard to the ratification debates. Same with regard to the Federalist Anti-Federalist Papers. This was universally understood. George Washington, the first president, said, we cannot use the military offensively unless Congress has deliberated on the matter and voted to approve it. And George Washington was there, what, presiding at the Constitutional Convention. Madison said the same thing. Jefferson said the same thing. It was universally understood. 
They're the ones who ought to know what they wrote and what they meant. Now, James Madison, who authored the document, he's viewed, in the words of a Washington Post reporter, as a fringe view of the war power. Fringe view, the guy who wrote it. <laughs> and explain why it was written that way. Because the executive branch could not be trusted with the war power, because they have all the incentive to concoct excuses. Because in war, as Madison writes, they get the power to award contracts, they make appointments, they get to leave footprints in the sands of time, they get the political and the jingoism, the popularity. So you couldn't trust the president to be fair and even hand in a judgment about whether to go to war. Therefore, they're out. In fact, Madison writes the most important and wisest decision in the entire constitution, he says, writing to Jefferson, was entrusting the war power exclusively to Congress. Exclusively to Congress. And he was surely right. Very prescient. He knew exactly what he was doing. And of course, the Congress, when it actually did feel responsible for the stewardship of the war power for 100 years, exercised it. We weren't running around the world in search of monsters to destroy. We actually grew very prosperous. We weren't wasting our money like Afghanistan, $300 million a day for 20 successive years to get a worse addition of the Taliban than we began with. We actually were spending money building wealth in the United States, building railroads, building infrastructure. Now, when did this all change? When, when did we start down the path towards congressional dereliction and building an empire, replacing a republic, making the glory, the signature of the United States, not liberty, the signature is the armored knight and domination by military threats or military force. It began about the time that the first great wrench in the separation of powers happened, uh, the, the uh, annexation of Texas. Uh, that was the time, 1840, 1844, uh, arose this mythical idea of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is manifest only to us, not the other guy, right? <laughs> it's manifest that we control you, you know? Now, it, it totally brainless idea. And that was a time when those who were there present at the creation of the Constitution had kind of passed from the scene. You did have John Quincy Adams kind of the last of the band of brothers who created this country. But he had been replaced by Andy Jackson who thought any idiot could discharge any government responsibility. He didn't need to know anything. Typically new and Tyler to, you know, you live in a, you grow up in a log cabin and you drink apple ciders and have Indian scalps and that makes you a political genius and know how to suspend habeas corpus illegally during wars in Florida and Louisiana. So this idea of manifest destiny comes at the same time that the president of the United States, then it was John Tyler, he, as following all the previous presidents, when we absorbed new territory was by treaty. The Louisiana Purchase was by treaty. He purchased Florida by treaty. So he proposes to annex Texas by treaty. He can't get two thirds of the Senate. So he goes back and says, okay, well, my gosh, in a premonition of John uh, Kerry as to why the nuclear deal with Iran was not a treat. Well, we can't get it passed. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an executive agreement that Congress will ratify. The both the Congress and the Senate, by simple majorities, would evade the treaty clause and just absorb Texas by statute instead of treaty. As it was, because ordinarily a treaty is viewed as an agreement between two sovereignties. Texas at that time was a sovereignty. We, as a sovereign, were agreeing to admit them into the country. Ergo, you need a treaty. I mean, after all, we even have treaties for migratory birds. So that's uh, a, a, at least a threshold that was satisfied by annexing Texas in terms of importance. But country went along with it. Tyler destroyed the Constitution. Now we don't have the treaty power anymore. You get around it by simply transforming treaty into something else. But that was the first break in separation of powers. And that has deteriorated ever since. It started to accelerate the Spanish-American War and it's gone downhill since then. Um, so we have, notwithstanding, say, the universal understanding of what the war power really means. Uh, the consensus in the United States is, no, the president can go to war on his own. That you need statutes to prevent a president from beginning nuclear war. There's been a prohibition upon a president beginning nuclear war for 234 years. 
It's called the Constitution of the, Art of, of the United States, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. What do you need a statute for? You put, you put something in, say, we'll impeach you if you go to run a, a presidential war because efforts to subvert the Constitution were defined as impeachable offenses. So here we are. Why, and then I, I want to underscore um, why it's important to think and dwell, if not fixate on the war power. Uh, when you were at war as a lawyer, that's the end of law. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Let me just give you an example. We don't know how frequently it's done. Since 9-11, presidents have asserted and exercised the power to play prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner, kill anybody he wants in secret based upon uncorroborated evidence as, yeah, I vanished you. You don't exist. <clears throat> no accountability. He doesn't tell Congress, doesn't tell the American people why you did it. If you try to get remedies and in going into court, state secrets, no. And the courts say, right, state secrets, we can't tell you why you picked somebody out for extermination. Really? That satisfies due process? I mean, we have attorney general defending this as satisfying due process? I mean, we know a couple things that get leaked out in the paper. The teenage son of Anwar al Awlaki, yeah, he just disappeared by the predator drone while he was having dinner. No, he was not on a battlefield. He wasn't threatening anybody. So what? You're, you're, you're airbrushed out of history. You're airbrushed out of the world. Mm -hmm. Under the existing legal architecture, the president of the United States could launch a predator drone and everybody sitting here, including me, kill us all and said, well, sorry, we made a mistake. We're collateral damage. No due process rights. I thought you were in imminent danger. I mean, that, to me, is frightening. We have a president of the United States following Nixon Frost, saying then I have Article 2 where I have the right to do everything I want as president. Shrug shoulders. No one says anything. In the presidential debate, did Joe Biden never question that assertion by Mr. Trump? Never. Because he claims the same power, right? You're going to go to war against China over Taiwan or whatever. We, I don't need to go to Congress. Even though when he was running for president in 2007, he expressly shouted from the rooftops, if President Bush attacks Iran without a declaration of war, I'm going to lead the impeachment charge. I taught separation of powers. I chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I know this stuff. I talked to my smart people at Harvard. That's an impeachable offense. Well, Joe, what happened? gone from an impeachable offense to something now you're crowing about that you can do when you're president. He doesn't recognize the inconsistency. Of course, no one writes about it and says, this is kind of crazy. Where did you get that power, Joe? How come it wasn't there in 2008? Did the Constitution get amended? Nothing happened at all. And then he felt, I want to use the power. I'm president. I'm great. So the heck with the rule of law. You say the architect of the architecture of, of war is complete lawlessness. Cicero, Cicero wrote this over two centuries ago. Times of war, the law is silent. You remember, we had our U.S. Supreme Court in World War II give approval to the concentration camps for Japanese Americans. There was not a shred of evidence that they were disloyal. There was not a shred of evidence that they were committing espionage. And you want to know how Orwellian that was. There was a general called John DeWitt. He was sent to the West Coast to survey the area to see whether he could discover evidence of impending sabotage or espionage. And he writes back and says, nope, couldn't find a darn thing. But that's confirming evidence that treason is afoot because they're making it so hard to prove that they ought to be in concentration camps. I mean, literally, you kind of wondered, is this written out of Alice in Wonderland? It was. Alice in Wonderland. And then we have John McCloy, great Harvard graduate. I think John Henry met John McCloy once. He was asked about the concentration camps. He says, well, if I got to choose between you know, killing the Japs and the concentration camps and the Constitution, the Constitution loses. Those are his words. So that's what happens in wartime. Complete lawlessness. That's wartime is what given us the, the, the end of the Fourth Amendment. We're probably being surveilled by the National Security Agency. They intercept everything that they can. No warrantless. Oh, we need everything we can look at because you can never tell what might turn up. It could be the last piece in this big jigsaw puzzle, even though since the warrantless surveillance has begun, the number of terrorist attacks that the NSA claims they've stopped in the United States 
because the surveillance is zero. None. They say, without that, all dead bodies on the sidewalk if it wasn't there, you know? And if the American people and the Congress goes along because it kind of operates as a placebo effect. Well, it makes you feel good because something's happening, even though it doesn't make you any safe. You're more likely to die from a bathing machine falling on you than by a terrorist attack. You would think you would get that impression by reading the newspapers and listening to the, you know, the, the national security papers are administered or issued every few seconds, you know, whenever they need a new appropriations for a military industrial complex. Anyway, that's why the war power is so critical. And we've been at war ever since 9-11. And there's no indication we will ever not be at war because the target of the war is a tactic, terrorism. You can't eliminate a tactic. You know, it's like declaring war against gravity. You really? There's ever, you can't end. And no one, given the possibility that there can be a terrorist attack, even people, even if we have the best preventive measures possible, there's always a risk. No one will ever stand up and say, you know what? The risk of terrorism is gone. We don't need to be at war with terrorism. So we have people now in, in high school and college, they haven't lived a day not being in a state of war, where, in fact, their civil liberties, due process, out the window. You know, we have estimated tens of thousands, maybe even millions of people who are on no-fly lists. Okay? How do you get on a no-fly list? Nobody knows. Government says, no, we're not telling you. How do you get off? Nobody knows how you do that. <laughs> you know, you kind of just guess. We really think we shouldn't be there. And the litigation goes on and on. And, uh, and what happens if the government thinks that they're going to lose the case? They'll tell one person, oh, we'll take you off the list. So it moves the case. You know, these are very expensive. And you don't know, get money at the end, very little. So they continue to have the no-fly list. We don't even know whether we're banned or not. And you could imagine, knowing politics, power almost invariably is exercised for ulterior political motives. The clearest example is gerrymandering, right? That's what politicians do. We have Thomas Massey. Thomas will tell you. Every single motivation from all the members, and I would say exempt Thomas, is driven by one overriding issue. Will it help me or hurt me politically? That's the only question. You don't sit back and think philosophically, well, was this at a precedent that will do damage to X, Y, Z? What a joke that is. That's all they look about. Is this going to help me or is this going to hurt me? That's why you have to have some government there, but you want them limited because you know whenever there's discretion, it's going to be abused. Try to make certain that everything's in the sunshine, it's transparent. There'll be some embarrassment by transparency that would inhibit the worst abuses or exercises of power. So anyway, that's, that's where we are. We live at present in a lawless state. Uh, we're running numerous unconstitutional presidential wars now. Um, we, we're just providing, people don't understand the concept of co-belligerency. That is, under international law, you become a belligerent if you are providing weapons of warfare, military assistance to a country who is a belligerent. Then you become a co-belligerent and you can be targeted as if you were belligerent, right? That's been the law of, of uh, international war for centuries. So we provide weapons to the U Saudi Arabia and UAE and Yemen, providing weapons to Ukraine. You can do it. Congress has to authorize us becoming a co-belligerent, however, which they have never done and which they would never will do. They'll vote resolutions saying things like, well, Biden's a good guy, Putin's a bad guy, it had no binding effect at all. But actually voting, you're in a state of belligerency? No way, run away from that. They want to escape responsibility and they don't want to honor their oaths of office and uphold and defend the constitution. They want to uphold and defend things that help their political party. And unfortunately, we have an electorate that doesn't punish anybody for these kinds of derelictions of duty. Uh, and both parties are guilty of it. And the presidents like it because they get all the power and each year it gets worse and worse. Um, and part of the problem is that I say the members don't have any risk at issue. They go back. The voters don't know any of this stuff. And they keep sending them back, even though they surrender all the power that they should be exercising and restraining you know, the empire. Uh, and it's hard to know, you know where you begin. Uh, one place is that the vast majority of those who come to Congress are clueless about what their oath means. They have no idea what the Constitution is. 
you know, they can maybe recite it like remember when you're five years old, you did the alphabet, it was like a song, elemental P and whatever, maybe they kind of can do that, read it. But understanding the words and the purpose and the background and the history, they have no idea what's what the what the the background is. Um, so we need we need, I say, training school for candidates for Congress, whether they're Republican or Democrat or independent or otherwise. But you can't you have to start someplace. You know, you can never give up in despair. The only sin is to fail to try. And so what I've done and I've talked to the members of Congress from time to time, I'm preparing right now a congressional pamphlet called you know, Congressional Tutorial, um, is ideas that at least structurally would regain the congressional power uh, from the omnipotent executive branch. But you know, intellect is only part of the equation here. If there's no spine and character and backbone to exercise it, it's just ornament. I can draft, I've drafted proposed bills. We could get out of NATO tomorrow. Talk to Thomas. A statute just says we're out of NATO. He said they would never been in, but certainly after the Soviet Union collapsed. Why are we in NATO? We're 98% and no one's attacking, no one's attacking us. If on an ad hoc basis, if a war comes, we can make alliances like we did in World War II. Why are we there already? Anticipating. And Congress could pass a statute, get us out of NATO. Yeah, but it may, at least you have something to debate. Why are we there? What does Article 5 mean? I think another idea I had was to, um, that, to confirm people in the executive branch, other than the president, who's elected directly, and have their tenure of office expire as soon as a presidential war begins. They no longer hold office. They're confirmed contingent upon no presidential wars. That we don't have anybody who then can run the war. The president can't do it on his own. Uh, even though it's unlikely to get through, it starts to get people to think about separation of powers and why we have separation of powers and what the abuses have been and where we can be without you know, presidential omnipotence, which doesn't work very well because we find out they're really not all, uh, all that omniscient because ordinarily you give omnipotence only to people who are omniscient. And I can guarantee you, we got presidents who are not omniscient. They make <laughs> staggering blunders all of the time. Uh, now, Congress can as well. And I'd like to dwell at least a few minutes on what I see as the structural advantages that we have uh, in entrusting these national security powers to Congress as is envisioned by the Constitution, as opposed to the president. And it's not because Congress is smarter, it's more moral is because the structure, the protocols they use to operate are more likely to safeguard against stupidities and blunders than the executive branch. You've got to have a consensus that you have to build, you have to have openness, you have some secrecy, but you have transparency, you have hearings, you have a huge number of people and you can't keep a secret because so many people are involved. You have to debate the issues. It goes slow so you don't do things very, very dramatically in a short period of time. You have a chance to digest it. There are people on the outside then can make comments. You know, I've been a witness 200 times for Congress. Well, you can think about X, Y, Z. There's a collective deliberative process that's involved that largely prevents hasty, ill-advised, secret decisions that are not corrected because they remain secret permanently if the executive branch would have. That's what they wanted with a program that Snowden revealed. Uh, and so it stays there forever. Congress, it's open, they make an error, and you can correct it. People can see it. And you can have a debate. Uh, and that's and, and you have and you acquire through the congressional processes, especially uh, when you have the party system, it requires you know, a super consensus. It's not just one person who decides. You've got to get a lot of different people with a lot of different motivations and incentives to agree, okay, this is what we want to do. It creates a higher threshold of unanimity before you cross the Rubicon into war, right? That's what you want. You don't want to rush into war for nothing. Because it's the worst thing you can do. I mean, war is truly, as it comes to Sherman said, it is hell. You know, you can't even look at these pictures in Ukraine. And I, I do a lot of this stuff elsewhere, in Nigeria, in the Congo, whatever. It's brutal stuff. You know, I'm reading through the, the transcripts of the Nuremberg trials. It's, it's as bad as walking through the, uh, the Holocaust Museum. The testimony, God, what is this? This is truly barbarian conduct. So war is a hugely important issue. 
It's not something that kind of just put in the algorithm says, okay, march off to war and everybody be happy. They're all losers in war. Nobody wins. It's never good to kill somebody except in self-defense. Never. Maybe it's a tragedy and you're forced to do it. You know, if you're conscripted and worked on it, that's never a good thing. It doesn't benefit mankind. It's not to be killed except if he's got to kill in self-defense. So we have these, um, uh, these efforts. I mean, the, the congressional deliberative process, largely transparent, that's far superior in avoiding errors than the executive branch. The executive branch does in secret you know, you're not on the team unless you, if you dissent, everything is, is concealed. They don't want to hear any dissenting viewpoints. The president has to be viewed as being omniscient. So if there's a dissent, then maybe somebody got, I mean, the perfect example is um, Vietnam War, LBJ, George Ball at the State Department. George Ball thought this was nuts, but he never said anything. American people thought there was unanimity in the cabinet. This wonderful idea, you know, it's rolling thunder and all the other stupidities that led to the that offensive and the five and disaster over there. You know, there was no transparency, huge lies. I mean, LBJ was planning to go upscale uh, the, uh, you know, upgrade the war at the time he was blasting Goldwater in 1964 for sending us into nuclear warfare. And he concealed all that and no one said anything. You don't have any oversight. The Congress doesn't, isn't able to do that. That's why as a structural matter, Congress is vastly superior. And they say no institution, because they're human, is flawless. It can make errors. But the errors that we can expect at Congress are not going to be at the stupendously, staggeringly dumb things that the executive branch does. That we see Vietnam is one example. Say Afghanistan is another example where we are in Ukraine, which is historically notorious for two things, pogroms and arms trafficking. And we think it's going to flower into some great democracy. If they win the war or not, it's like believing if we overthrow Putin, we're going to get James Madison and George Washington and Russia. You know, where is that going to come from? I don't have it. We've got to understand the limits on what we can do. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't dream about a nice democracy there. Great dream to have. But we've got to be earthbound. It isn't going to happen. Not in our lifetime anyway. And you just got to accept that. You might want to do away with the force of gravity in our lifetime too. But you know what? It's not going to happen. You got to deal with reality. Um, and that's why we have to have limits on what our, our ambitions can be. Uh, not because we're callous, but because we recognize we can't solve everything. And an attempt to solve everything means we solve nothing and make it worse. So the other elements we do have, in my judgment, have to come into play. And this is what the framers would have wanted. This is we need resolutions that say president who commences war without a congressional declaration has committed an impeachable offense. And we'll get rid of you. You're not going to serve. This would be, right now, Congress would never do that because they, they delight in running away from responsibility right now. They delight, they don't want to vote on any of this stuff. And, and, and Thomas Massey, uh, the members of Congress and Walter Jones, who I knew before he passed away, they're open and, and candid about it. Yeah, they didn't want to, we don't want to vote on this stuff. Only it's a hard vote. We're not here to go make hard votes. We're here to please our base and, 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 and stay in power and, and have, uh, you know, three-day work weeks. Great. And you really ought not to be in Congress because they're really not Americans. And we would have never won the Revolutionary War. We'd never had a constitution if that was the attitude of those who created this country. We all ought to feel grateful to their sacrifices and wisdom. And you know how you appear grateful? You honor what their handiwork is, you know? Not run away from them. Because what we're confronting today is far less at least in terms of the risk, but they confront. They, confront. they, they lost, they can be hung. They pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. We got nothing at our at stake here. Comparatively, we go home, we got nice food, we got, we got comfort, all that kind of stuff. I mean, we're pygmies compared to them. They look at us as ingrates. You're doing nothing. We hand you, this is what we, we, we give you this fabulous inheritance superior to anything that any other people have ever received in the history of the world and you squander it? You know, so you can gather more Twitter followers or something like that and drivel. Uh, so that means we have to really undertake, you know, a revolution in terms of our values and our understanding and perception of ourselves as a people. In addition to understanding, uh, the architecture is there. 
This is if there's a saving grace to the situation that the Constitution itself is perfectly intact. It's like an undamaged Taj Mahal. It just needs to be exercised. Just follow it. That's all we need. And the absence of the dereliction. And that requires a little bit of courage. But we have Thomas Massey, and as Andrew Jackson said, what's a majority? One man or woman with courage. Anyway, probably gone on too long, and uh, I'm eager to entertain any questions. That's some questions here. Bruce has got everybody so positive. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of hinted this a little bit, but we'll discuss a little bit more about what you think is going on now with regard to uh, uh, what's going on in Ukraine right now, and specifically about the type of support that I'm speaking about that just a little bit. What concerns might you have of possible parallels between what's going on in Ukraine today versus Czechoslovakia in 1939? Okay. I and mean, you can talk to Vietnam too. I mean, that the Munich idea and, and then in March of 39 is always thrown out. But anyway, let's let me let me um, begin um, uh, with some background here. Um, at least with regard to the Ukraine situation. Uh, and it's not unique to Russia, but we also do the same with China. It's clear that ever since the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the United States has a transparent policy of encircling Russia. Yeah. Uh, this, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have had a policy. We have, we have the same in Russia, I mean, China as well. Our policy is to, has been apparent for decades, uh, to encircle Russia and China and destroy them as any conceivable rival, because we should be the only power, a superpower on the globe. Uh, and that is clearly apparent to Russia and China, even though we deny it. Uh, but we expanded NATO despite George Kennan's warning that it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and we're including countries like North Macedonia and Montenegro who couldn't possibly contribute anything to the United States. It looks like, well, what are we doing this for? And the latest we have Sweden and Finland. Um, and we, uh, so that from the Russians' point of view, they're going into Ukraine to say that's, and the, the, the Ukraine has in their constitution, they're dedicated in their own constitution, they want to join NATO. So it looks like, you know, pins are an existential threat to Russia. I'm not defending them because countries have existential threats all the time. They don't attack their neighbors. We're the only country in the world that has no existential threats and tax countries. Um, so I'm not, I'm not defending the provocation. But the fact is, the fate of Ukraine uh, to the security interests of the United States is zero. We have no national security interests implicated in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians are going to fight because it's their, they feel it's their country, whether we gave them a single weapon. The Mujahideen would have defeated the Russians in 1979 in Afghanistan without giving a single Stinger missile from Joe Wilson or whatever the guy's name was who had the movie. What's I forget his name? Charlie. Charlie Wilson. Charlie Wilson. So the fact is, as they get bogged down, it's good for us. They're certainly not attacking. They're not doing anything to the United States of America. The United States has no national security. Like, who would care? If, I mean, we care as human beings because we'd be callous if we could look at somebody being destroyed and said, who cares? Hey, they're human. You know, we're all human. So we certainly have a sympathy for them. But in terms of actually getting involved and in being a co-belligerent, no, it doesn't matter at all. And that's why I wrote an article saying, you know what? The only message that Putin can get that stops the warfare is we get out of NATO. And then he no longer fears he's got an existential threat because... NATO without us is a paper tiger. I think Russia is a paper tiger too, but shown by its dismal performance in Ukraine. But that's up to them. So the idea that, that Putin, whose defense budget is about one-tenth of the non-US NATO defense budget, is going to treat this if, if we stop supplying weapons. Oh, this is Munich, and I'm going to be like Adolf Hitler and, and have the Wehrmacht, and I'm going to have Hermann Goering and, and, and march around the world. That's ludicrous. He has no power to do that whatsoever. He can hardly even defeat Ukraine. He can say, I can understand other countries want us to be there because, hey, they don't have to lose. They, they, they let us be their Hessians, if you will, mercenaries. 
it diminishes their defense budgets. We don't have to sacrifice anything because we're willing to do all the heavy lifting. That's what we did in the Balkans. You know, when Serbia blew up, it was right in the, 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 uh, the, the Europeans' back door. There's nothing. We had to come in. You know, we were the 911 call. I noticed the other day, uh, Kosovo, that we created. They're asking for a military base. Who's, who's military base? The United States. We should build it there and protect them. So it's the, we have to recognize that some things in the world are not perfect. And we cannot make the world perfect. And my view is, no, if, if, Ukraine, if Russia defeats Ukraine, you think that means that, and I doubt that's going to happen, but it could, we stop all the weapons. But even if it did, that means that Russia is now going to be attacking West Germany and these other countries. I mean, he can hardly even defeat the Ukrainians even before we're given weapons. These guys, he's got a brain drain. You know, his, his economy is in shambles. It's ridiculous. So that's what we've got to come to. I find no parallel whatsoever between uh, you know, Munich and the March in Czechoslovakia in March of 1939 or otherwise. Uh, Hitler was a, was a rising power who had ability uh, to do more mischief than just there. Putin has no ability to go anywhere uh, other than maybe a few inches into Ukraine. Oh, Jeff, you We've got at least half a dozen members of Congress here, and I want to offer at least a tepid defense of Congress. Uh, I think everybody that's here who came to hear you uh, are among the 57 who voted against the, uh, the last independent vote we had on funding Ukraine, funding the mischief there. Uh, what they've done now, what Pelosi has done, and I don't mean to malign her in particular because I... I've seen our own party do this. They're combining the funding of Ukraine with Florida disaster relief, for instance. So I don't think you're going to see any more independent votes on Ukraine. They wised up once 57 of us said, no, we're not sending more money to this effort. But with that said, that's my defense of the 57, six of whom are here, I think. Um, what's your advice in the next two years? I know you have long-term plans and you think as far forward as you no backwards. But what's your advice in the next two years of what Republicans could do or what Congress in general could do? I, I say Republicans because the anti-war left seems to have evaporated with Tulsi's departure from Congress. Uh, but what's your advice to us yeah. before, okay. before my colleagues have to leave? Yeah, well, wonderful. And I apologize for the colleagues there. I understand voting against the additional money in Ukraine is bad enough. But remember, Biden has gotten us in to co-belligerency. You should introduce an article of impeachment, whether it goes any place. There's no declaration of Congress to make us co belligerent in that war. Um, uh, oh, okay. There was, there was never any. I mean, that's what could have been done in addition to voting against the money. Um, uh, and I say also, what can, what can the Republicans do? All, I, I understand that we're beginning like at the bottom of Mount Everest. You know, Edmund Hillary has taken the first step, and we've been so imbued with this limitless executive power and war and otherwise for so long that we, we, we need to at least begin with a conversation. So Congress needs to hold hearings, have debates, introduce bills just to get the discussion underway. Right now, unless that happens, and I can tell you having written letters and articles, the news media doesn't think it's worthy of discussion. Oh, well, it's not going to go any place. I don't see anything in Congress. You guys do something, then at least it can be a subject of discussion, and then we can have a sensible, rational debate. What in the heck are we doing? And you can have oversight hearings. Well, where does this power come from? Have expert testimony, gather the wind. Where are all these great presidential wars? Where have they gotten us? Oh, why, is, why was James Madison wrong? So and I, and, and that's the beginning process is to make the issues that I've addressed today subject of serious debate and contemplation in the halls of Congress. And you have the ability to do that because you have a platform. People will pay attention to you because you're Thomas Massey and other members of Congress. You have a vote. You can go out there, you can write off edge letters to the editor saying, we got to, this is way worse than just not funding it. We're even, even without the funding, we're giving intelligence and all sorts of other military aid to Ukraine. Hey, if it's a good idea, the president needs to convince us and get a declaration. If he can't do that, maybe it's not a good idea. Members of Congress, they sing the same national anthem. You make the same Pledge of Allegiance. You have the same loyalty to the United States as the president. Why is he the better judge of what our national security interests are than you? You have all these earmarks of loyalty as well. You don't have any interest to have the United States go down the drain. So that's what I would focus on. Have an agenda could be an omnibus hearings. And if I want to, I want to 
give a model, Thomas, look at the Fulbright hearings on Vietnam. That changed things. The last time we really had serious oversight 